So today is July 25, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. And uh, we were just continuing, um, we had an earlier conversation about geoengineering and its pitfalls and why we shouldn't uh, even try to do it. Or uh, do you want to continue, Hugh? Yeah, Gary was making a point. Do you want to carry on with that? Oh, yeah, sure. Guy? Uh, yeah, what we went through was geoengineering, and uh, I was just pointing out that the, the sort of global predicament um, in every way, uh, economically, environmentally, uh, climatically, that all of these are, are like circular problems and human efforts to to kind of escape from the difficulties are just feeding back into the difficulty all the time. Uh, and the sort of underlying thing with all of this is that, is that uh, all of these attempts to do something about it are not going to get anywhere. Um, and it, it seems to be the underlying thing that people have to wake up to regarding what the world's facing at the moment. Um, it, it, it's just to pull them up by indicating to them that, that, that all of these plans to, to you know, to reset or to change, um, they're all modifications of a of a, 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 a system that's got to go in its entirety, that you're not going to reform any of this and you're not going to uh, break out of it by, you know, I mean, I suppose it goes back to that thing that, that Einstein was supposed to have said that the same mind that created the problem is not going to be able to solve it, you know. So, um, yeah, just going to say, say something like that. Well, it's, I think, a good idea to make a stand against geoengineering from our point of view just because it separates out the sheep from the goats. So, you, the, the real divide is between, you know, the alien cortex and the rest of our brain. And so if you actually buy in this narrative that there's progress and things that people have done are good, and, you know, if we, that we split the atom was a great achievement that was good and humans are in charge of their destiny and all this kind of infantile bullshit that you're, you know, grade school teacher might have told you. If you're actually too stupid to see your way past all that and to realize what fucking hubris it is, it's like humans were never in fucking control. A lot of this stuff is just the fact that people have become, de you know, domesticated and not in contact with nature anymore. If you are on a boat in storms and you see these electrical storms and the moods of the sea, and you think you can fuck with this thing, 
it means you just haven't been out in, in nature enough. It just means you're a fucking sick individual. It means that you are not really human. You, you've, you've become so divorced from reality in your little cage in a cubicle in, in this urban environment that we are not adapted for. It means that you, you kind of lost. You know, it's like these apes that basically have been incarcerated for too fucking long. You cannot release them again. They're broken. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people on Reddit and a lot of people, they are broken. Luckily, most of the world's population, particularly those that live in poverty, particularly the, those that, you know, live in the global south and in Africa and in India and stuff like that, those people are not yet broken. You can actually salvage those people. As for Britons and people that live in an urban environment like New York or Beijing or London, they probably fucked, and rightly so. So the fact that these, these people are, you know, so deluded means that they probably are right off. And they're not any use. They're actually dangerous. Because if they do any activism, you should basically try and demotivate those people or just shoot them through the fucking head if that fails. Because if they do any activism, if they try and move and shake anything or do a revolution, it will be a revolution for control. Now, the basic ground rules that I hope that we can we can agree on as a you know just as as the extinction RG is is that really we're probably heading for a big crunch that you know no one can avoid it. So it's you know it's like we probably passed the tipping points. I don't think we can really you know we can't avoid a big catastrophe at, at this stage. It's going to come. It's just what flavor. So we, we can still collectively choose you know, what flavor of crash we're going to have, but we can't choose not to crash. We're at the stage where we're going to have to crash land this plane. Um, and so, you know, we can deny that we need to crash land the plane. In other words, fly until basically it's, it crashes hard and with, uncontrolled or we can try and do some kind of controlled crash now the controlled crash that these guys like the world economic forum and the klaus schwab and all these you know bankers and stuff is they trying to do a controlled crash where they in control okay i think that's going to be a fucking nightmare if you and the reason is it was a nightmare in south africa that the, your problems start when some psychopath decides that they're going to control the situation that's out of control, they are your biggest problem. So if you look at Katrina and you look at after the San Francisco, okay, all these disasters, Puerto Rico, you name it, the biggest problem is the guys that are trying to keep control and solve the problem. They, you know, when people go to get baby formula out of the Walmart, they call that looting and they start shooting people. It's, 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 those people are mad because they have this demon in their heads that they lead us. They're in control. It's their responsibility to manage this. That narrative is what basically causes all the trouble. The humans are spectacularly good at sorting themselves out at the local level. When there's a disaster, they give mutual aid. Everybody steps up to the plate. We're great at that. We're great at doing survival in about a Dunbar's number. So what we need to do when we hit the wall is to get rid of all these power structures and basically try and, and reduce um, center of control to the local level and no bigger than about a Dunbar number. So Americans are awesome at this. If you cut the head off the snake, you make sure that basically they lose control from the Pentagon and from the White House and basically, you know, even if it devolves to state capitals, it's it's good enough. But you really want even the state capital to devolve responsibility to the people and step down. If you do that, you've got a chance. You have diversity. You, uh, you, people will actually give each other mutual, mutual aid. They'll start doing mutual networks. You break the long lines of communication that are so dangerous. Those uh, you you 
break the, the military and all the, the uh, essentially you get people to de-arm instantly because there's no use for guns if you actually devolve to the local level. So if you have autonomous communities that are self-governing, uh, they're unlikely to give each other any trouble. They're unlikely to give their neighbors any trouble. The trouble comes from these basically loose federal arrangements and state level arrangements that try and keep control to the bitter end. Those are the enemy and they don't know they're the enemy and it's it's possible that we could convince them and I think we should. We should, we should make it a target to try and, you know, have a disaster plan that includes their buy-in that they will step down. I think that there are people even, if you look like a the mayor of Portland or, you know, even even the governor of, say, Oregon or something like that is, is they're not so stupid that they don't see this coming. And, and they actually on could be on board with a plan like an autonomous community like they did in, you know, in Queen Anne's, um, you know, Queen Anne's Gate and stuff in, in Seattle. And so they, they, they you know, they, they're not that dumb. They they are, they might be dumb enough to send FEMA and the National Guard, um, police, fire, and stuff. Send, send get them to stand down. Just defund them and send them home. If they did that, they would be doing an incredible favor to the country and the people. Now they don't know that yet, but they could be persuaded, right? So it, I think that's a reasonable goal. Now. What I think is liable to happen is what I learned in South Africa is people have an incredible capacity for staving off the inevitable and making it worse in the process. So it's it's like McNamara in Vietnam. Everybody knows Vietnam's lost, but they they do this escalation of commitment because they cannot face defeat. They, they keep on knowing that... Uh, this is a lost cause, but they throw good money and good lives after bad because they they just cannot admit defeat. They cannot relinquish control and they cannot back off. So you can't get a character like McNamara to stand down, even though he knows he's lost Vietnam. He still goes through the motions. This happened after Stalingrad. After Stalingrad, the Nazis knew they were done. But they went through the motion selling hopium screams like, well, they would have the V, you know, V weapons would come and save them. You know, there would be some kind of kamikaze program that would save them. They always had these hopian things, and geoengineering falls into that category. That the divine winds will come and save us in the last moment. That the gods will suddenly turn. It's like there might be some black swans, but it's unlikely. You know, like the a big wind came up and saved Japan from an invading Chinese army, and that's where the kamikaze wind comes from. It does happen occasionally. The Winds blew the armada off Britain when it was being invaded. But it's not very often and it's not very likely in this thing. If you're looking for a black swan to sweep in and save you, it's it's better to assume that it won't. So uh, so if, you know, but these guys cannot step down. So if you look at like Germany after Stalingrad, well then everyone, everybody with a brain in the German um, staff knew that they were screwed and it was only a matter of time. But they still suffered their, their worst losses and defeats that most of the people died after Stalingrad. And everybody in the concentration camps, they died from starvation because of the decision that they couldn't elect. If, if after Stalingrad they said, okay, we get it now, we, we've lost, they would have been a million times better off if they just capitulated, just just let the Red Army roll in because they knew they were going to anyway. So look, let the Red Army roll in with an intact Germany rather than destroy Germany to the last blade and then have the Germans come, the Russians come in when they're really angry and they're ready to rape left and right and shoot people. So it's like it's the hanging on. And they have infinite capacity for hanging on, and they will stretch it out, making it worse. Geoengineering is exactly the flavor of this. It's basically, it's going to make things certain. The end of geoengineering is that we will have drop the ball eventually, and then we'll be in a heap of trouble, because there's the moral hazard. They're going to use this as an excuse to crank up fossil fuels. Why wouldn't they? You see, the scientists are fucking Boy Scouts. They are 
politically inept and clueless. They don't understand the real world. They understand engineering problems and not very well, by the way. So what they do is they they assume, well, well, this will give us more time. What do you think? people are going to do with more time the oil industry is going to say now we have a thermostat why the fuck are you doing austerity we don't need green tech anymore we can do we have a cheap useful black gold we can burn it to the last drop why wouldn't you if you can lower the temperature what's the downside the downside is the future that you're going to argue over that thermostat you are you are too much of a toddler and to and the human species is not responsible they don't have the risk we didn't have the restraint to stop getting into this climate crisis how the fuck are we going to have the restraint to control a global thermostat it's like you're going from you know a basic level of of uh, responsibility that we failed completely and now you're going to actually go to the advanced class and try and win there you failed in the little leagues you cannot advance to the advanced leagues. Are you fucking retarded? Yes, they deliberately retarded. So there are a million little snakes in all of this and the arguments they go. They're all about the alien cortex protecting itself. The alien cortex has made its own habitat. It did niche creation, and the niche creation, you can see, it's geometric, it's boxes, it's cities. So cities should not exist. They, they are the brain, they are kind of like our left brain spilled over into nature. They've killed it. And so, so those vampire squids, those, the cities and those boxes and stuff, they need to be erased. They're not viable, right? They are, but, but the alien cortex wants them because it's its preferred habitat. It made them to make itself self-sustaining. So in the process of making its niche, which is the urban environment, it costs us about 10% of the rest of the brain. It's dehumanizing us while it, it makes this transhuman city and, and the cityscape. Okay, so now I can prove to you mathematically that this is not viable because a city has to be managed and a city has to grow. There, there's no such thing as a, sustain, a sustainable city. Why? because it needs resources from outside. There's only one incentive to bring resources from outside and that you can profit from it. If you profit from it, it means you have a growth incentive. You have to carry on growing. If you are a farmer from Gebekli Tepe to some, you know, Jeff Bezos with Amazon serving New Yorkers, you have this deal. I will go to the far ends of the earth to basically kill nature and bring it and serve you in a market in a city. So there's only one reason to do that, and that's if you actually make some money, more money than you expended going out to get the, the, the commodity. If you do that, you have more money to invest. What are you invested in? Getting more shit. What else would you invest in? It's capitalism. So basically, a city has to grow. If you said, no, we will not grow, then there's no profit in bringing goods to an urban environment. An urban environment doesn't produce anything. There are a load of people with bullshit jobs in the service industry. They're nothing. They're non-producers. They're drones. It's, it's, a, it's a dead colony of drones that is just sucking from the surrounding living planet. Right? There's nothing going on in a city. There's no production. Zero. They say, well, you know, soon the service industry will create as much GDP as the rest of the economy. That is not GDP. That is non-production. Those people are going into work. They are flipping bits on a keyboard. This is not production. It's not doing anything. How bits and keyboards and letters are arranged on a screen doesn't matter a shit to nature. It's not production. If I write Shakespeare, all I've done is I've rearranged letters in a fucking document, right? Nature doesn't give shit what, how the letters are arranged in a fucking document. So I haven't done anything. I've just burned electricity on my fucking computer and I've eat at coffee and then I went out for an avocado sandwich. So basically, I'm sitting there like a cunt just tapping away at a keyboard. That's actually unproductive, but it's counted as big on GDP. And then I fucking go and get a 
avocado sandwich that some ass like Jeff Bezos got from South America, put on a plane and flew here, right? There's only one reason he does it because then he gets more money and he both reinvests it in more avocado sandwiches and more planes to actually bring them to New York. And that's the reason why they grow it, right? So if you say no more, we just have these silly cunts that are doing nothing except consuming in New York. And nobody's allowed to profit from bringing them all their goodies. Why is anybody going to give them any goodies? They're not going to do it. So this whole thing doesn't work. Now, people just don't understand it. And some people are incapable of understanding it for about four reasons. One of them is they are on a payroll and they really don't want their life to end. And the alien cortex doesn't want its niche to disappear because it's kind of cancer. It doesn't want to be cured, right? So, so those people are irredeemable, right? The thing is, they all go away when you pull the plug. This whole thing runs on the grid, right? This whole massive infrastructure, the global networks in the global supply chain, they all rely on electricity, the grid, and increasingly cybersecurity. So just that alone means that they, they're as good as gone. They, they're one serious cyber pandemic away from over, right? So anybody that's relying on the grid, if you, you know, in an IC unit, ICU unit or you make your living on a computer, it's, it's not sustainable in any long-term respect, right? So, so therefore, these people either have to realize that and make other arrangements or otherwise they have to have the grid pulled out, either by ecotage, by war, by, by some way you're going to lose the grid, right? Look at South Africa, right? If you go to South Africa now, is the grid is not staying up because the, the reason is they're not investing in infrastructure, there's financial problems, there's uh, instability, and they're getting water problems. What that means is the government's going broke and the, they they corrupt and basically they can't keep generating power. So they're brownouts, they're blackouts, people have to live with that more and more. That's a problem that's going to get worse and worse. It's not going to fix itself because basically the whole situation, the global situation is getting worse. So you have to imagine yourself in one, in one of these big cities in America, Beijing and stuff, you're gonna get interruptions to the power thing. There's, you see, it might happen abruptly or it might ha happen intermittently, you don't know, but you know it's gonna happen because we're, we're probably heading into serious financial instability, maybe deliberate, but either way, imagine power companies and the utilities, they're gonna go bust, right? They're gonna close down. The, it can get to the stage where it's capping too fast and too unmanageable for the central government to do anything about it. The central government is really stretched. If if there's a serious financial crisis and say power companies and stuff in the U.S. Uh, don't have enough money to pay employees or you know get coal or other raw materials to burn and stuff, if there's that kind of financial crisis, the federal government uh, will be seriously stretched to say you know ring up you know. Edison and say, you know, PG&E and say, uh, excuse me, okay, well, we're going to give you these little notes and they sort of government promises and you use them and see if, you know, basically the shipper will send you some coal. But, the, you know, just tell them the federal government is guaranteeing your shipment of coal and they've got to go around the houses doing this for about 6,000 power utilities. It's like, it's not going to happen. So basically, the so so it's vulnerable from so many ways. You know, now, what they're likely to do is they're going to try and prop it up every which way possible. And the first of them is they're going to try and engineer the climate too. Now, all of their solutions, the danger is not that they won't work. The danger is they will. They will all work probably in the short term. The problem is they're trading the short term for the, for the long-term consequences. They're borrowing from the future. So geoengineering is just fixing the problem now with the expectation that everybody knows it's going to be worse later. What they tell the kids and themselves is, but 
technology just keeps on going from strength to strength and soon AI will sort out the problem. It's a lie. AI is bullshit, right? Quantum computers are fucking snake oil, right? There's, there's these load of fucking lies, you know, that none of this stuff, even fucking Neuralink implants, they're a trick. They don't fucking work. Nobody's going to fucking put implants in your head and make fucking cell phone calls. They're lying. Elon Musk is a fucking grifter. So basically they tell all these lies saying, well, human ingenuity and technology is moving so fast that we'll sort out the problems later on. For, and that's what they've always said. And guess what? They've always got worse and worse later on and bigger and bigger. And now there's a super wicked thicket of problems. We're in a predicament that we cannot get out of. No, nothing can help us now. And so, so basically, but they're still telling the same lie. So the important thing is when people defect from the lie, when people say, like, I've had it with this shit, that's the Ceausescu moment, right? So Ceausescu ran Romania for 40 years. Bullshit, 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 same old bullshit. Everybody knows. Everybody sees everything getting worse. Everybody listens to the bullshit. Yeah, 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 all the shit. And now all the same old people saying, you know, oh, it'll get better. This is just a teething problem of communism. It'll all work out later. And so everybody knows it's bullshit. The nya, 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 nya people are the loud ones. The quiet people are quietly resentful. They're stewing, and the number of them are growing. Eventually, Ceausescu stood on a balcony and said, you know, everything is good, and, blah, blah. and on live TV, somebody booed. That broke the spell. The whole square in basically in Bucharest, 80,000 people broke into booze. That's something you could go to jail for or die for, right? If the, they, the guys in the TV stations, they didn't switch the TV off. The, basically, the political operators or the, the version of the Stasi, they came and tried to get the television sh shut off. They didn't shut them off. They rebelled. So all over the country, millions of people saw the forbidden thing. There's a fucking old man on a balcony and these people booing and shouting and screaming at him. He was gone. Gone. They broke the bloody spell. So it's all about a spell breaking moment. So we need to get a narrative to, to get people to the point where they stop believing the stupid progressive spell that they snap out of it, right? That's our task. And our secondary task is to make sure that we have some kind of resilient safety net. So when all this fails and goes pear shaped, we will have some kind of mutual support network and, and, and basically a formula for how to actually devolve. So we need basically to have a trigger when something happens, you know, like we're heading for dictatorship or totalitarian. The day it goes totalitarian, we have to be ready for a vast network of as many people as possible to unplug, that they know the drill and they know the moment. You give the keyword and you say, now, now we unplug, we decentralize. So some cunt like, like Trump or something is left in the Pentagon or in the bloody bunker at the bottom of the White House and saying, like, where's the governor of fucking Seattle? Where's the, where's the fucking governor of California? And say, we can't get them on the line, sir. They unplugged the fucking grid. See, that's the moment. Then he's just a stupid fucking old cunt sitting in a bunker in Washington. And the rest of the world is unplugged. We're not interested in the story anymore. It's bullshit. We're going to take it from here and do it alone. And then some people have got a chance because not many, but you've got a diverse bet, right? What you've got with centralized control is all your eggs in one basket, one all-in bet on a fucking insane plan. So that's the thing that we need to avoid. And this is not a hard story to communicate, but people are in various levels of psychological development. And, and the people that are most entrenched in, in our technical lifestyle that are in places like New York, they know that they're not viable. Particularly people like, you know, trans people that are reliant on them, people that, that are, are disabled and reliant on the medical system. All of these are shills for the system, right? They are a very, very sad story because the system cannot survive. 
if the system survives, then the, all of us are likely to die. So, so they basically backed the wrong horse. Anybody that is entirely reliant on the grid, on, on technology, on the healthcare system, you back the wrong horse. If you need medical, if you need pharmaceuticals and stuff for your survival, you haven't got much longer to go, right? There's, there's, you cannot imagine a system where the healthcare system's intact, all these institutions are intact, and, they, and they're basically feeding you, right? Just can't see it. We're likely to be going into a situation that's much like the fall of Rome or the fall of like Nazi Germany or something like that. I'm telling you, when Hitler's in his bunker, his priority is not, you know, going to be to get you hormone blockers and stuff like that. So, so just, it's just not going to, it's just not going to happen. So, so, so those people become our natural enemies, not because we're prejudiced against them and that they are a tragedy. They are a walking tragedy, but they, they will fight for the status quo and they will fight for technical civilization because they're dependent on it and they're selfish cunts. They have no self-sacrifice. You, they wouldn't be in this identity politics if they had a, a semblance of self-sacrifice. So they, you, you have to say that they're not on team human. They aren't really fucking human when it comes down to it. And so when they're going to fight the, the, you know, the great unplugging, because they're selfish, right? The, the most noble thing they could do is say, yeah, okay, we were an, a mistake. We were a domesticated chimp that's not viable. And then say, like, we, we accept that. And, you know, you do the thing, you know, the romantic Hollywood trope where, you know, you're the one that detonates the switch or something. It's like, that's good. That's noble. That's how you redeem yourself if you're one of those people. But for, for the vast majority, they will go down fighting for the system, right? at our expense and the expense of animals and the expense of future generations out of pure selfishness this is the alien cortex speaking and so so that's the lay of the land it's basically it's all in you know sheep and goats is are you for technical civilization and the alien cortex is monstrosity but or are you on team human and you want diversity you want humans to have a chance you basically reject the monoculture you you don't embrace peace and kumbaya and stuff. You just say, we want humans to survive. And so we need a vibrant crop of different types that are disconnected from each other and occasionally fight and act like humans. See, we don't want a big world where everybody wears the same pajamas and stuff because, you know, we'll be wiped out by a pandemic. If these guys start genetic engineering and stuff, there's only going to be... There's only one type of perfect human. So, you you know, if you're the guy who has, you know, the Genentech patented formula in your kid and you have three or four other formulas, then, then you will be the basic generic turnout of what you get as a genetically designed baby with $100,000. And so that you will be a fucking clone. You, you will, it's just like any fucking fad or fashion that happens is everybody's got this fucking same fucking Nikes and they just a small different flavor of Nike. Well, genetic engineering will be exactly that. It's a consumer culture. So, so it'll mean that we are genetically very, very narrow, essentially cloned. Clones all have the same, the same uh, fate. And that fate is that they wiped out by a pandemic because there's not enough diversity. The viruses basically will adapt until they can attack that clone. And when, when it does, all our eggs are in that one clone basket. We're gone. The whole point of humanity, the whole point of why we have a Dunbar number and we have tribes and we separate and we war occasionally and stuff is to defeat viruses, right? If, if AIDS ever came and invaded a village, that village died out. Well, that's really tough shit, but at least there's 99,000 more. Well, now we're in one global village. When that global village gets disease N, we're gone because we're all interconnected. We're all in one fucking village. We have to get back to a million villages. Otherwise, humans don't have a chance. So then you can say, well, does it matter about, you know, the climate being... Yeah. Look, the climate is gone. We passed the tipping point. 
our best bet now is to just make sure it doesn't get worse. I think that we probably headed for basically finding out what the, the, the new stable regime is for the climate at this level of CO2 and greenhouse gases. So in other words, we're going to reach a climate sensitivity and no one knows what it is, but let's pretend that it's around three degrees. Well, some people might scrape through, but they ain't going to scrape through if we start geoengineering. No one's going to scrape through because they're going to take the parts per million up to fucking infinity. There's, there's almost a thousand years of natural gas in the Pennsylvania field alone. America could use the Pennsylvania field, the, the LNG that comes out of Pennsylvania. They've estimated that America at its current consumption rate can use that for a thousand years. If they did that, there would be no life left on it. We would be at about 1,800 parts per million. Where the fuck do you think they're going to go if they have a temperature control? If they can cap the temperature at 1.5, they're going to take the parts per million up to 18,000 or more. They're going to drain the Pennsylvania field. Why wouldn't they? It's cheap energy. It's dense. It's perfect. It's, they're going to run the world on it. They already are. The, the energy transition happened. It was a transition to liquid natural gas. It was from coal to liquid natural gas. Solar panels and stuff is just a nice to have on your boat. I see nobody's powering their fucking cities with fast wind farms and solar panels. They're just an add-on. More energy for more eco-destruction. That's yeah, all the, they are. The solar panels are like a luxury item like the electric cars is what I, I think what it seems to me. Well, well they're worse. They're the, the hopium that basically encourages people to keep loyal to the system. So, so solar panels and wind farms are actually terribly dangerous. And the reason is they're psychologically encouraging the, drink to, the drunk to think that, that they'll be okay. So in other words, they're kind of like a seatbelt in a, in a car. And now the drunk thinks, oh, well, now I've fitted a seatbelt to my car. I can drive home. That's all you fucking do. You're just encouraging bad behavior. That's just, that's all those fucking green, and green tech. The green tech industry is a is a is a bunch of fetid, horrible little shit billionaires that, that should all be shot and shortly will be, hopefully. And all of them basically they just want to line their pockets. So Elon Musk and that all of them have built their fortunes on government subsidies. So they just using kids and Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, and they're using them to basically get more money, shake it out of the government. And the government can do it because they're just printing money. They're Currency is based on fuck all. Currency is based on a whim now. So you can go to the government and just shake them and basically dollars will fall out of them. And that's what these green tech billionaires are doing. Now, what happens to that money? Well, if it goes for insulation in a British house, if it goes for uh, solar panels or, or wind farms or anything like that, well, now you've got solar panels and wind farms. Think it through, assholes. Think it through. Biden's just point 1.9 trillion into an infrastructure bill, right? Calling it green, right? Do you think that reduces CO2? Of course it fucking doesn't. Think it through. That 1. trillion goes to buy solar panels. A lot of the money goes to China, but a lot of it goes to the people that install it. Those people, you know, labor is... Payroll is a big item. So all this infrastructure build, it goes for jobs. It goes for, for paying people, right? These are surplus. These people wouldn't have had jobs without this 1.9 trillion. Now, what are they going to spend it on? They're not going to spend it on CO2 reduction. They're going to spend it on CO2 creation. If, I put a, if I'm a laborer and I install solar panels on your house and they pay me by the hour, I'm going to take my 15 fucking dollars that I get as a minimum wage and I'm going to go and fucking buy a burger that was flown on a fucking plane from Brazil. And now I can buy a fucking two burgers or a bigger burger. And then I can go and take a fucking holiday in fucking Spain. I was going to 
basically go on a caravan or stay at home because I didn't have the money. Now Biden's given me 1.9 billion of green money. What I'm going to use it for as a green job? I'm going to use it on a fucking holiday to Spain, you stupid cunt. I'm going to be burning fucking babies in fucking jet fuel. Are you fucking stupid? This money goes into the economy and circulates. The economy is a fossil fuel economy. You put money into it, it's for growth of growing the fossil fuel economy. The, it doesn't matter if the point of insertion was green tech. The point of spending and the circulation of the dollar, it's going to circulate at at least one, you know, once or twice every six months. Basically, the velocity of a dollar is probably four times. It's going to change four times in a year. The first hand is for a solar panel. That hand will go and buy it from the dirtiest fucking carbon producing thing that you can imagine. And all the other three hands until the government reabsorbs it with like Fed repos and stuff will be dirty money. So, for, so basically you increase three times. You put $15 into my pocket with a green job. I've spent it, th passed it on three times. And those three times are going to be fossil fuel producing fucking monstrosities. So you're not getting ahead. You put 1.9 trillion into a machine that generates carbon. doesn't matter that the excuse was, well, at first we put up solar panels and wind farms. You fucking cretins, man. Just do the fucking maths. So, so it doesn't work, right? So we have to stop all the stupid shit. We have, so it's, it's not a big task, right? People can get this in a moment. They all kind of know it. You just have to separate those that are redeemable from the fucking sheep that are not. So we want the goats. The sheep are going to slaughter. And they go to slaughter the day the grid goes down. Right? May, I, may I, may I yeah. add something to what you're saying? Is about, you know, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the alien cortex and the way that... Um, uh, geoengineering is, is is probably coming from this sort of reasoning. I see that also in the way the pandemic is is uh, is handled. And you posted something very interesting on on the sub today. Well, it's not interesting, but true about the, the the man burning his passport in South Africa. And and I'm thinking of all these uh, new oh, health. That, that, that's Nelson Mandela there. Yeah, yeah. That, that's Madiba, man. That's Madiba. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I'm thinking about all these people and I've been talking to some over the last few days who are scared into into getting a, a pass whether in all sorts of parts of Europe and uh, don't you see in that also the, the working of this this logic this kind of we'd say uh, alien cortex way of thinking that you know we're going to have a society where there's going to be people who have got a passport who are going to be clean and people who are not, even though it's not substantiated by any science or anything at all. And it's it's going down like very easily. I, I'm seeing people who are just starting to just uh, morph into this new reality and say, well, if I want to live, living meaning consuming and, you know, doing all the things you said, you know, buying burgers, going to cities and stuff like that, or holidays to Spain, only, only uh, on under the under the, the assumption that the, the health passport, or the, how do you call it, the, I don't know how it's called, COVID passport, I don't know the name of these things, is, is instituted. It's, yeah, health passport. Yeah, health passport. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing as geoengineering, really, when you think of it. It's just giving, giving a sort of a, of a, a cure for, for saving the economy and, and continuing uh, continuing to live in a totally crazy way and traveling and everything like that without uh, uh, do you follow me oh yeah yeah you see the, the why you see this these echoes you see these uh, some uh, similar similar little crumbs similar crumbs where the, the reason why you see the similar crumbs coming over and over is because the the alien cortex has a an idea of order and control so it, it wants everything to be predictable. So pre, before, dictum is basically word. So it can say in advance what's going to happen. And the reason why it wants to say in advance is that there's no risk. So 
it wants control and it wants order because it, it can't afford to have risk. So as a plantation owner or even a farmer, your enemy is risk. So, so all the shit hit the fan when we started agriculture. And so the farming mentality is taking risk out of the system. If you see right back in the beginning of like the Old Testament, they, they're not asking for long life or a boon or anything. They're asking for like, will my crops please grow? Will we have a bumper harvest? They, they're all farmers. They all want, you know, keep my flocks safe from the wolves and stuff. It's, it's basically they, the trade-off for farmers was that they needed security and predictability. They needed predictable rains. They needed everything to go like clockwork. And then farming works. Farming doesn't work when things are unpredictable. Now, when the, I think what happened, as far as I can tell in my research, is they knew that we were in big trouble since the 50s. By the time of the Club of Rome, they did modeling, the cyberneticists, forests, uh, the, all those, the guys in the, in the Club of Rome, the Macy Foundation, uh, they looked forward uh, to see where we headed with this. There was the time of Ulrich and the population bomb, and they knew about peak oil, People were looking ahead to, to the risks. And they decided that there was severe stability, instability coming around 2020. So from about 1950, they've been thinking, okay, you know, completely linearly, because an alien cortex is completely linear. And so then they're thinking instability is coming. Instability is risk and trouble. Therefore, we need control. And so they started from the Club of Rome as how do we get control of this situation? Well, they've been working on this for 50 fucking years now. Basically, for my entire life, they've been working on how do we get control when this scenario hits the fan. And then lately, these guys in like Extinction Rebellion and these kids just, you know, learn about climate change and then, you know, get concerned and three months later say, oh, we must do something about it. Well, you're too fucking, you're 50 years too late to say what happens because they decided what happens. And the, fucking obvious what, what their decision was is how do we keep control? Now, you can see in document after document, you can see in like the Rockefeller Foundation had a key document that you can see in the Council on Foreign Relations. All these think tanks from the RAND, all of them put these scenarios forward. And they they all had the same kind of feel. They were like, you know, we could go this way, we could go this. So in that crucial Rockefeller document, it had four scenarios. When you read the document, you think that they're saying we must try for scenario number four, which was all, you know, roses and light, basically what XR wants, that we would have a regenerative society, that, that everybody would work together, that all the, you know, in global government, there'd be you know, participation between nations and everything will be, we'll all work together and stuff like that. And then basically it's said in that, that then the downside of that, he said that then there's too much autonomy. Everything's too decentralized. And basically the, there will be a loss of central authority and a loss of control. Everybody looks at the nice rosy picture and thinks, oh, that's where we headed. They say, no, they rejected it because of that little byline. It said that it would be lack of decentralized control. They are the centralized control. So they went for scenario number two, which is called lockstep. And that said, well, there'd be fucking chaos everywhere. There'd be ecotage. There'd be anarchists running right. But the, what it said in, in that was, but with, you know, you, they can mitigate everything. There can be centralized control as long as it's strict and authoritarian. And they went for that one because that was their preferred one. You see, the streets can go to shit. If the golf courses are still running and you're still getting champagne, you don't give a shit, right? I'm with all these guys with their fucking helicopters on their super yachts, right? They, they can, their, their super yacht can just plow through fucking everybody. They don't give a shit. I'm telling you, man, there's a super yacht here. I swear I thought it was a fucking military frigate. It has a fucking gun on its deck, right? It's a private fuckhead. It's a private, he's got a 
fucking frigate, right? With a helicopter on the back and a fucking gun on the front. Right? He's a private tit that sits there in a the cravat talking to his ugly fucking plastic Stepford wife. Those guys don't give a shit. They don't care what happens on the street. They don't care about your NHS. They don't care. We, we're fodder. There are too many of us. We're surplus. They don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about the guys in white tunics that are fucking serving them steaks. They don't care about the fucking steak on their plate. They're predators. They're vampire squids, right? These guys are not human. So basically, those guys, those guys have a plan. And guess what it is? We will stay in control to the very last, right? Because in their formula, if they lose control, life isn't worth living, especially your life and especially every other critter on this planet. Those lives don't matter compared to their control. So that's the problem. Those guys are the problem. It's that control narrative. And how do they sell that control narrative to all the sheep? They say safety. You, you need us. You need centralized authority. It's just like the fucking V movie. You know, you need to remind them why they need us. That's what it's all about. So in a lot of ways, these guys need turmoil. The more, the more secure their position is. So look what happened on January the 6th. I don't know what the fuck went wrong, but we almost got to a situation of tyranny in America. How that script should have gone was basically they, they brought out the troops for national, for, for the, they invoked the Insurrection Act to keep law and order. They declare martial law to keep law and order. They like martial law. They're not trying to avoid martial law. Like martial law is their best gift. They love to get there. So basically, where they were headed, clearly, I don't know what happened. I don't know why they, somebody blinked, but where they were headed was martial law. From martial law, then all bets are off. Constitution's out the window. Nothing matters anymore. We ruled in America by the diktat of a stupid psychopath. And so, so that's coming. Right? So we need to, we need to prepare. Right? And hopefully. So when it. you, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, just say when you go for this meeting, can you reproduce a, um, if you can reproduce a rant like that at some stage, you're probably going to have to, aren't you? Hope, no, hopefully it's not necessary. Hopefully, hopefully we're singing from the same page. I mean, well, there, I there are a few I, things I, that I think that they don't understand. And, and one of them is they don't understand finance. They don't understand conspiracy. They don't understand the military. They don't, you know, they're, they're major holes in their thing. They don't understand that they're... This thing is all arranged by central banks. Yeah, but this is a this is a huge stretch for people who don't get that. It's a huge stretch to win them over in three days, isn't it? You're more likely just to freak them out. Yeah, but you don't have to. You don't have to win them over, right? You see, okay. So let's 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 answer the question that you you posed in the comments on the for the agenda, and that that's that. You know, what do game designers and artists and stuff? What do they actually do? Okay, well, get so you can start to get the flavor of how this might work. So, if you saw Bright Axiom, right, you can you can see the a couple of things. One of them is is how recruitment it's done. So that was one way of recruitment. It's people really like the idea of exclusivity and exclusive invitation, a bit of mystery. Everybody's waiting from a call from God to say. You know, this was just a dress rehearsal, and your life wasn't supposed to be this way, and your real life is about to begin. And everybody's waiting for that fucking call, right? Never fucking comes, but you can give it to people. Everybody wants to be Neo in the Matrix. They all want, so somebody said, you know, the reason why trans people are, are you know, have gender dysphoria in that is, is because of this. They know everything's fucked up. One of the problems with this, you know, trans trend fad is that 
it's they they taking people that are genuinely fucked up and dysphoric in so many ways and they're telling them the reason you're fucked up is because you really should a girl <laughs> it's like no it's not it's because of this fucking you're in a gulag you you are in a intolerable system with structural violence and you you're a chimp that has been uh, put in a cage so you basically go into a cage chimp in a zoo that doesn't know what a zoo is and you say you know something's wrong don't you you say uh, yeah i thought that since the day i was born and you say instead of saying well it's because you're in a zoo we're not supposed to be in here we're supposed to be in the wild in africa instead of saying that what they're telling each other is no the reason is because you're really a girl chimp so you know cut your genitals off it's like there are all these false solutions to the problem no one wants to name the problem it's kind of like the alien cortex is, has has all these devious ways of doing makya of setting people off on the wrong track so then you know if people say like i get it i'm a cage chimp we, this is unnatural we're not supposed to be in this environment then the alien cortex is pretty screwed so what the alien cortex does is it confabulates a million reasons why it's you know your problems are not this your problem is you don't buy a tesla your problem is that you aren't rich enough the problem is that you're not a youtube streamer and the problem is that you know you didn't buy the right clothes you didn't fit in with the right code you didn't do the psychotherapy the problem is that you have bipolar disorder the problem is anything other than saying the problem is that we're fucking chimps and we're not supposed to be living like this so because that's the first step and say how do we correct it and say well we've got to trace back how this started and then we're on to the alien cortex once you've seen the alien cortex then you're like in the 10 bull scenario in in, in zen so that 10 bull scenario plate number four seeing the bull so it's basically you see the bull and you know exactly what the bull is it's up in the night sky they knew it from shamanic times that bull is taurus that bull is the bull that everybody is speaking on the fucking Murdoch media. They are all full of bull. If you go back to Chattel Hoyak, right? One of the satellite cities about 3,000 years after Gobekli Tepe, but it's probably the same people, right? They have, they're obsessed by bulls. Those are not domestic bulls, they're aurochs, right? Serious wild version of a tame bull. And they're teasing the bull. They, they have almost like these acrobats like the you know this in in a rodeo where you have the clowns or like in spain in the bullfights you have the uh, picadors you know, the, the picadors are basically the clowns that play with the bull uh you see in crete um that the minoans they also have frescoes where they're teasing the bull and say what are they doing there they're showing their dominance of the alien cortex right so they they're they are basically showing their dominance of this figure that they can feel and they can represent symbolically uh, on a wall. Now, coming all the way to the modern era, we can't even name it. We can't even name what our problem is. It's all indefined. It's been deliberately obscured. The, the alien cortex is a liar and goes to excessive lengths to lie, to divert people. Or well, it's, it's, You can see it in psychopathy, right? collectively our system and our institutions are psychopathic now if you look at an individual psychopath and see how they work you'll see what they do is they're continually spinning plates they're continually setting people off they're putting people on edge they're creating confusion also that they can keep control yeah but just thinking about what you were saying in, in, uh, when we had a brief exchange and you mentioned something about turfs to uh trans exclusionary radical feminists which i hadn't uh been very familiar with so i read uh the wikipedia article and uh during the course of that article it explained that the term turf can be taken pejoratively uh and very interestingly it also said that the term cis uh, you know cis male female that that term is also pejorative and 
it just just connects back, I think, to what you were saying a minute ago, because I thought, yeah, in a way, because once you say somebody is cis male or cis female, what you're doing, what it's doing is it's pathologizing normality. Um, and I think that connects straight back to what you were saying a, a minute ago, where, where we know something's not right, but um, that gets pathologized as depression or gender dysphoria instead of the fact that something's not right is a very accurate uh, message that you're receiving fr from your, your deep human aspect, I guess. Uh, and the, the, the task is to find out what the fuck's going on. Like you, you end up in this situation where everybody's blaming a disease or blaming themselves for a, a massive um, uh, sort of, I guess, alien cortex generated problem in terms of the environment we live in. Yeah, the system tries to make you take responsibility for its faults. So it tries to make you take personal responsibility for the systemic failures. So it's never the system. So basically, if, if kids are not doing well at school, nobody ever says, you know, why are we doing this? What's it doing for these kids? It's basically, they don't like it, they don't fit in here, and they're not doing well. What would suit a kid? Nobody says that. They say there's something wrong with a kid. Now the kid must fit in with the machine. And that's what it does with all of us. So it's basically, it's the same thing is happening with, with, the, with the jabs. It, it's saying, like, if you don't want a jab, it's basically, you have a problem. We're going to make this your fucking problem. We're not going to say that there's a problem with the system, that they shouldn't allow planes and trains and ships and, you know, all this infrastructure and all this, you know, goods and transport to flow around the world, which is how the pandemic spreads. We're not going to touch that. That's too sacred. But you're going to have the fucking problem. You're the fucking pariah because you're not going with our stupid fucking program. I mean, the, pro the program's always retarded. Geoengineering, the jab, whatever. Any, anything where you try and manage chaos by this fucking top-down control is doomed. But they're going to do it. And, and also, it's, it's always short-term. So the jab, right, it might work in the short term, but in the long term, I can tell you a hundred ways it's going to go wrong. It's going to breed, you know, variants faster. There might be prions and long-term effects. It's basically, but in the short term, go work. But that's what I was saying. It's the same thing. It's parallel to geoengineering. I mean, we're just talking about the same type of reasoning. You know, it's just, okay, we but, jab but you, you what, jab what, you, what right? they do. be another pandemic and there'll be something else. It's just... You know the same thing. Yeah, but you see, you see the, the technique of control which they've perfected, uh, all bullies have perfected, is to get people uh, to betray their future selves by uh, uh, just giving them an intolerable short-term deal. So, in other words, uh, you know, it's like if you torture somebody. The, if you wind up in torture, what they're doing is they're saying, "You can't take the pain, can you?" Well, then you know, basically give up. And um, and then the pain will stop. And then what it, it does is it forces you to say, well, the long-term consequences of giving up under torture are going to be really bad. You might even be shot. So, but you do it because your short-term self just wants the pain to stop. And so they always trade, they always do that to you. They always say, uh, get get put you at odds with your future self. So geoengineering is doing that, saying, well, you want to be safe now, don't you? You know, so like we've got to do this and then say, yeah, but my future self, oh, don't worry about your future self. <laughs> and then they know that your future self, they have a longer term view than you do. So so basically they can always get you. It's like a bank, a, a bank will, you know, put a, a consumer item in front of you that's too good to resist. Now, they're going to basically take you for a ride. By the time you've bought that consumer item on credit, you've paid for it twice. But they have the long-term view. They're looking at this sucker is going to pay twice for this car. And you don't because you're like, oh, my current self wants this car. My future self will pay it off later and it'll all work. And that's how they keep us because they're looking at your future self. 
It doesn't matter about your current self. They, they don't suffer a loss for your current self. They sell you a car today. They, they torture you today. It's cheap. It's cheap to set somebody's um, current self against the future self. And uh, we don't have the smarts to do it back to them, right? If, if you have, uh, you know, what, what Anarchists showed in the 19th century, if, if you have a system of targeted assassinations, that's the end of the game for them, right? It happened in the 70s, in fact. It, it, Manson and the, those guys were, uh, it was a lot more going on than just Manson and those guys. I remember David Niven wrote in his in his book in his autobiography that he was in california it was a very time it was a time when they were about to get very anarchic and uh somebody in that frame of uh, the manson thing and was, it was a kind of a much bigger than just manson it was a zeitgeist of the time and anyway this guy came up to you know in beverly hills and shot david never's David Niven's neighbor. He basically knocked on the door and shot some famous guy in the face. And then David Niven and all these guys, it changed Hollywood, it changed the way the movies work, everything. They didn't say so. They didn't, they, they made up a story afterwards. They didn't really say how close they came to actually succeeding. So the same happened in the 19th century when they did targeted assassinations, the anarchists did targeted assassinations of royals. It almost brought down the entire industrial system, right? Because the, the those royals were scared. They they knocked off a lot. I'm talking like 20, 40. Eventually, it ended in World War One, but you know, the, the uh, Franz Joseph was shot by an anarchist and um, called Princip, and that in Sarajevo, and then that led to to the disintegration of the the old world. So it worked. Right. They don't teach you that in history. But imagine now if if you imagine a hypothetical targeted assassination program for billionaires. Okay. You think they would still be prancing about in Davos and going to states and that if they knew that people took um, long range shots at them from a mile with a Barrett rifle? Hmm. They would all go underground. That would be the end of the Great Reset. Right. You, you, you just yeah, it's, two, three, four. That, that would be it. It's very easy to do this. It's just people don't have the courage. Yeah, it's uh, it's making them fear consequences for their actions. Like, you know, I was bullied a lot in high school, and the only time they stopped is when I got physical, right? And I think you've had those experiences too. Like, bullies don't stop unless you put a hurt to them. You have to get physical and hurt them, or they won't. Stop. Yeah, yeah, but you see, you, you, see, you have to give you up your long-term self. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. But but you see what? Yes. But but you see what you're doing there, is is that you are sacrificing your short-term self for your future self. See, that's what most people can't do. That if you teach a rebel to do that, they fuck. I mean, the system is fucked. You see that? You see. By going up to a bully, you are and smacking them on the nose, which I've done since the age of four, thanks to the, <laughs> the good teaching of my sister, my older sister. But, but you see, what what you're doing there is you're saying I don't care that they come back and do this. It's basically I'm going to basically take a chance for my future self because if this works, I get a lifetime free from this bully, right? So then. You, you take the big hit. You might get the shit kicked out of you, but, uh, you, you know, you're free from then on. Basically, just the fact that you fought back, even if the bully pulverized you, then they, you, you can still come back. You can get the society on your side. You can, you can still nail the bully saying, look what he did to my face. <laughs> you know, you, you, basically, you end the game. The game Underdog only story. works. Yeah, it, the game only works because the worm doesn't hurt, turn. That's what I was saying about Ceausescu. So 80,000 people standing in the, the square in Bucharest, right? The worm turned. See, Ceausescu's a bully. He, he has all these bully boys, all this network of bully boys that, that are cowards, that all, you know, like every cop. They're a cop because they're a coward. 
They're, they're a cop because they can put on a uniform and bully people without redress. That's why you become a cop. And so ba basically it's all bullies, supporting bullies all the way up. The moment you fucking turn on those guys, they're gone. If You see, if you look at a bully like Putin, he was one of these bully boys that was put on location in Germany. Right? He was traumatized. Because when the wall came down in Germany, he phoned up his handlers in the Kremlin and said, there are people calling all over the embassy. What do I do? And they said, you're on your own. <laughs> he never forgot that. It shaped him. Basically, that was his defining moment. He was traumatized. Right. So what a million, million Soviet soldiers would have done is they would have gone and hidden in the basement. Basically... Putin was quite quite a guy because he said, well, well, fuck it. I'm not going down fighting. And he went out and addressed all the rioters and, and basically saved his ass that way. And then he, he reasoned with them and talked his way out of it. But he never forgot that basically he that uh, the system he was protecting wouldn't wouldn't lift a finger for him. So he never forgot that was the way the deal was. And so Russia's run on that principle today. The same applies to every cop in uniform, every National Guardsman and stuff. Because they like the power. They like having boots. They like having guns. And they like having a huge system behind them. So, yeah. But that system doesn't, doesn't protect them. And as soon as they realize that, they fucking, you know, gibbering wrecks. See, it happened in Vietnam. It happened over and over All the, the guys in Quezon in Vietnam, the biggest trauma was that Uncle Sam let them go. See, the, over and over, armies find that, that find that out. They find out the hard way, that, that when they lose, that there's zero support. So, the, so then they, they, that sobers them up. But, yeah, it's, good. it's a good thing to get the, you know, security forces on that, on your side, especially in PSYOPs. And the best, the best psyops for guys in security forces is saying, like, they haven't got your back, man. <laughs> you know, it's like no guy left behind, no Marine left behind. They're going to leave you behind, dude. <laughs> it's like, seriously, you think the state's going to shed any blood for you because you basically saluted their flag? It's like, not going to happen, dude. We're going to fucking get you. And that scares the bejesus out of them. You see, what Gene Sharp said is, you have to give them an out. But if 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 all the if all the ACABs know that they they are on a losing streak, but you say like, okay, dude, we have a ticket for you. You're gonna you can join the Extinction Army. And we've got your back. We're as thick as fucking you know thieves, man. And so he's saying like, you know, oh, well, they turned on a dime, right? All cops are weasels. So, so Gene Sharp says you give them an ad, say that they have a place in the new regime. And as soon as they see the writing on the wall, they come over. <laughs> we'll get there, don't worry. <laughs> but the, the main aim is, is to make sure all these systems stand down when there's a big crisis. So everybody agrees on this. The libertarian right and the, the savvy left um, which there's much left of, but, but you know, um, everybody knows that if we're heading for a big crunch, uh, we have to disarm and neutralize all these power structures and all the ones that then try to step into the vacuum. Because there are lots of guys trying to step into the vacuum. See, a lot of, everybody knows that the shit's hitting the fan, and they all jockeying. So basically, Klaus Schwab and all of these guys is a good totem to focus on. But he's, he's only one of many, right? Everybody, the vultures are circling. If you look at people like the Mormons, they're all getting ready. They have a hundred million war chests to give to Mitt Romney or whoever turns out to be their pale horse. They, they are getting ready to take over the reins and apparatchik of power, right? So are the Scientologists. Yeah, it's like uh, lots of these guys that are preparing for this day. The left needs to catch up.
Yeah, it's just like, you know that part in 1984 where the uh, weaselly executive gives Winston that book on, you know, the history of, like, civilization and resistance and stuff? And it talked about how, like, always, like, the middle class and upper middle class are always circling to try and move up to the seat of power. And it always goes that way. And then the working class and the slaves and all that always get screwed by it. Yeah, yeah every so, revolution so turns into a counter-revolution and... Well, well, you see, the thing is that after, say, the Velvet Revolution or the revolution in Romania or after Tahir, Tahir Square in Egypt, that there were lots of people that were positioning, right? So in in Egypt, it was like the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. So the, the you know, the people do the dirty work and overthrow the government. Then the, the guys who take over all the vital in, infrastructure, the telephone exchange and the power station and the police station and the post office, the guys that do all that, they rule. And, the, you know, the, the rabble are just disorganized, right? So, so they don't even know what to do about it. As far as they, they can't even identify it. They're just like, hey, our guys have taken over the telephone exchange. <laughs> you like, found out later. It's not really our guys. These are guys who we've never fucking heard of. They have their own fucking name. Where did they come from? Well, they've been in the middle tier, organizing, organizing, waiting, um, this waiting goes, for This goes back to something uh, I think we were talking about regarding um, Uncle Ted. Um, there was something, uh, an article, and I made the comment that, oh, there was a part in the in the in the article, I think, where it said that he had a political agenda lined up as well to bring into action after, uh, you know, demolishing the the the, the uh, whoever was in control. And uh, I think you made a comment that you were surprised to to read that, and I was too. But maybe what he meant was just what you were talking about, what you just said a minute ago about the left not having grasped the fact that it's not just enough to spring um, a revolution, but you've, you've then got to have a strategy for for uh, filling in, occupying those spaces that, that the, uh, the opportunists, the authoritarian opportunists will jump in on. Um, so maybe Kaczynski actually meant so much a political agenda as just uh, a plan for, for what you do. Um, after after the revolution to stop it from being taken over. Yeah, plan for filling the vacuum. So so all those guys are power hungry opportunists, and so our situation is different. And so the see what those guys did. You see, like Yeltsin, all these guys, they they are um, senior to, you know, they kind of second tier apparatchiks. So they know the system, they have the talent and capability to take over the factories and the, the infrastructure and all the utilities and stuff like that. So then what they, what they do is they take it all over and they asset strip the, the country. So they, you know, you, what happened in the Soviet Union was they privatized everything. It happened in Egypt too, in fact. It happened in, after the Arab Spring. Is they privatize everything the acid strip it and they sell it to their buddies for small change. So they all become rich. And then they, they become an entrenched uh, plutocracy. Now, our situation is a little bit different because we have no desire, hopefully, to be any kind of entrenched plutocracy. There's no win in it if there's environmental collapse coming. So environmental collapse changes everything. So what we need to do is to make sure in as much way as possible, even in our local environments or on a broader scale, is that there is no system for the other guys to take over. You see, all those guys are ready to like, okay, just use the example of take over the tele telephone exchange because that's what happened in Barcelona because basically <laughs> the anarchists and the, the communists fought over the telephone exchange because they suddenly realized that whoever controlled the lines of communication controlled the whole battle. And so 
there were lots of you know, a fierce gun battle broke out of it. But in, so in essence, it's the telephone exchange, but assume it's like the internet. So whoever controls the internet, social media, and all the distribution channels, then, then later the other infrastructure like water and sewage and stuff like that. But, but here, here's the deal. All those creepy cunts that are waiting in the wings to swoop like vultures, have the rug taken out of them if your aim is to decentralize and localize rapidly. So in other words, you can, if you took out the grid, those guys have no command structure, right? They're dead in the water. You just take out the grid, the sewage doesn't work, the power things don't work, there are no lights on at Walmart, there's, you know, there's, you can't pump gas at the gas station. But, so they don't have anything to take control over. So the, you see, if, if the rebellion, say in the Arab Spring, was well organized, what they should have done was uh, had some way of taking down the grid and um, keeping it down voluntarily. And then if they ever lost control of it, basically you want the power stations to, to, to have fuel and be able to be started up again in an emergency. So if anything goes badly wrong, like, you know, there's a cholera epidemic because the sewage builds up or something like that. You want to be able to switch the power stations back on. But if ever you lose control of them, you want to destroy them. But either way, if you can keep the grid from coming up, it doesn't matter who can, you know, it doesn't matter. They can't talk to satellites. They can't mobilize. So, you know, it, they can't mobilize Apache helicopters against you and stuff. If uh, if the grid is down, so and anyway, if you become delocalized and um, if you rapidly decentralize and localize, there's there's not a lot for helicopter gunships and stuff to shoot at. <laughs> you know, it's basically you're a homesteader with attitude, and um, you know they they're, they're like I don't know. There's something like nine hundred. Apache helicopter gunships. Now, each one of those is formidable. But America is a population of 320 million officially, maybe 380 million unofficially. But 380 million people. Doesn't matter if you have a Apache helicopter, there's no targets. Um, that was. Uh, so there's no targets in, for the. Yeah. That science fiction story, that short story called um, And Then There Were None. Uh, was a little bit, uh, I think that demonstrated that point in a way because um, uh, basically the story was that the uh, the authoritarians went back to visit a planet that they had seeded with people quite a lot, 400 years before. And when they arrived, uh, they, all, they were basically living an anarchist um, yeah, There was absolutely no central control. There was no control anywhere. There was just everybody was just had a system had an arrangement you know for for, for getting along, uh, and of course when the spaceship landed, the first thing they wanted to do was say you know take me to your leader because we're here to announce that we're taking over uh, you know we're 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 claiming back uh, control of the planet you know we, we've let your expert, and it was just hilarious because they just went around from place to place, and. They they couldn't control anything because there was no it was so nebulous that there was just nothing they could do. Uh, they, they were they, and, their and whole there was no money and there was no money at all. No money. There was no, just no, nothing that they could. Was, yeah, 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 everything was slippery. So, so, there was so, just so they they their control. So this is not was, science fiction, though. No, I know. So, so this the, is the not story. This the is story not science was, fiction. Was, mm. No, but we've just seen this with the Taliban. So, so we've just seen America beaten in America and Britain beaten in Afghanistan, and they defeated by the Taliban. The reason is they didn't offer any targets. So basically, they they too distributed, they they too decentralized, and but they solid, right? They they are real anarchists. The Taliban are real anarchists because they don't accept leadership. 
notionally amongst themselves they will they'll accept a tribal warlord and stuff like that but but in essence it's only because there's war there's a kind of understanding that like look as soon as we got rid of the infidel you're not going to be the big boss anymore and even if you are i've got an ak-47 and you walk pretty slowly so it's basically they have an innate understanding about this arrangement what it means is that you know how many trillions did they spend in Afghanistan? It was all lost. So, so we've been there since 2003, no, 2001, 2001. So it's 20 years, 20 years. Fucking hell. You know how much money was wasted? It just went into the pockets of Raytheon, TRW, Boeing, and all these fucking criminal gun dealers. So, so basically all that, all those resources went for basically nothing they just were blown up on mountainsides and in weddings and shit but it's it was absolutely unproductive activity in america to the tune of fucking extra i don't know could have been a trillion they hit it all could have been a trillion every year so it could have been like you know one fourth of the gdp i mean or, or one fourteenth of the gdp and it, just imagine what they could have done with all that manpower, material, and money. And yet they chose it to just waste it, get all these kids traumatized in the army, and then uh, and, and feed the Exxon. Because wars are big business for big oil. They're very thirsty. So, so yeah, and, and what did it lead to? Nothing. How were they defeated? Taliban didn't present a big enough target. And so, so the, this is, this happened in Vietnam, and this has happened. So the the great example is the Zomia people. Yeah. So, the in the highlands in Vietnam and Laos and stuff, have a look at the Zomia people. They also handle handle it this way. They just when they tried to tax them and get them as coolie labor labor and stuff like that. What they did was they just headed for the hills. And then there wasn't anything to attack. They didn't have towns. They didn't have, they didn't have grand reasons shit you could attack and stuff. So there were 100 million people that survived uh, without the oppression of civilization. And, and so, yeah, it, it, can, it can be done. But the, those Pashtuns and, and things, the partisans and stuff that defeated the British and then became the Taliban, they... they uh, they they were always very militant, so you can't be a milk toast, right? You, you you have to be fierce, you have to be egalitarian, and you have to be distributed. With with a lot of loose networks, right? A lot of lo new, loose mutual support networks. But yeah, you can defeat Rome with that arrangement, and we will. <laughs> yeah it's almost like being nomadic is probably the best way humans survive <laughs> yeah they look look at the nomads right they although they became islamic they're not seriously islamic so so the the bedouins are kind of eh, islam islamic they kind of eh. <laughs> so they notionally is islamic but just basically because you know they they don't want to get a hard time but they, they're not committed uh muslims so so that yeah the bedouins too they escaped the arab empire and it, that was a trick and a half it was very very difficult to escape the arab empire. the arab empire was brutal it, it became the islamic empire after they invented islam but it started off as the arab empire and it's it, it's one of the most you know enlightened but at the same time as brutal as any of our of our uh, of any of our empires and it's um yeah it's very difficult to to escape it and it still stands today thanks to america <laughs> but it won't stand for much longer right i don't think i don't think any of these things can can hold together but but they're going to try one of the ways they're going to try is with geoengineering and stuff like that all these ways of staving off staving off the inevitable
Well, has that done it? Are there any more questions or should we end it on that note? Yeah, I think this was solid. I can't think of anything. <laughs> Well, don't let anybody on Extinction Rebellion say that there is no plan or nothing that you can do. <laughs> but, yeah. it, See, the it, great it's thing the about plan this... that they don't like. It's the plan they don't like, I think. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> because they technify. But you see, you see that I think the final showdown has to be between Team Human and the Technophiles. And so there are a lot of people that currently think that they're allies that will find themselves um, divided. And so, but but I think that the divide has to be that way. And I, I don't see, you see, it makes a simple narrative, team human and life against, you know, cyberneticists, transhumanists and death. It's, it's, it's just the easiest narrative to do. It's, you know, it divides the room 50-50, but just think about it. It only divides the room 50-50 in, in a bunch of people that are, are not viable in the long term. So if, if you went to India or Africa or something and proposed this plan, the room would be 100% in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in terms of the world, it doesn't divide the world. It divides 1% of the world from 99% of the world. So, so it'll divide the room in London, New York, Paris, Beijing. But it divides the world 1% to 99%. See, that's as part of the narrative is they're paternalistic. And if the grid goes down, all the poor people in the global south will suffer. Suffer what? A few tears for you in New York, maybe. That's it. But they'll be laughing, baby. Laughing. You want to know what you can do for the global south? Unplug the global north, you stupid cunts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. it's like... On that note... I... Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things I thought of that was interesting is like, I was talking to somebody and I was like, yeah, um, civilization is basically a hedonistic, death-denying fantasy for the 1%. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and it, it is a complete fantasy because these house slaves are not in on the game, right? They've sold out for pennies. they sold out for a few shiny trinkets. They're not having a good life. They have a life in a cubicle. It's a life not worth living. But they sold out for it. They sold out for a bit of health care and a few promises that we'll have flying cars one day. But, it, like, what a bunch of stupid saps. Because they're not insiders. Like uh, Molly from... They just they just get slaves like us that don't know their place. Yeah, like Molly from Animal Farm, that horse that just like left the Animal Farm for more sugar cubes, just going where the sugar. And and wound so. up in the glue factory. Wound up in the glue factory. <laughs> uh huh. So. <laughs> yeah, so they all Mollies, man. They all a bunch of Mollies. But look how few they are. Right, and take the middle class. So, and and also the the great reset and the financial great reset. Well, it's hollowing out the middle class. So we're heading for for e feudalism. So, so the middle classes in in Europe is holding together a bit, but in America and the the rest of the world, in China as well, the middle class is going to be hollowed out. And and so. So those are the only guys that add any bulk to the story that, you know, progress is a good thing. <laughs> it's like no one at the bottom thinks so. And uh, and the only people that are really benefiting are the 1% in the OECD countries. So the, you know, 40% of the middle class in the OECD countries, they're not really benefiting. Not in any meaningful way. College education and retirement. It's all a big fucking... Well, I suppose the question is how, that how quickly will they become, will they wake up and uh, become radicalized? You know, or they're just going to be terribly slow about it. 
uh, that you, we must think of this, that they are actually the enemy, and you probably don't want them to wake up. You see, don't forget, they're not really viable, and this, um, this lifeboat is actually overflowing. So if you're looking for people to jetson, it's the, the fat fuck at the back that is eating all the ration. So don't, don't forget that, that, you know, if you live in New York, it's going to be overcome by fucking diseases as soon as the sewers doesn't work and they don't pick up the garbage. So if, if you can't run water, see, so you can't run water and you can't get to the top of a high rise when the grid is down, right? So, I mean, half the people in New York would die of a fucking heart attack if they had to walk up the stairs to their apartment. And so, so just imagine when the, the grid goes down, right? The water, air conditioning, is, it's not going to get up a high rise. So a lot of those people are going to be taking the easy way out. They're going to be, instead of going down the stairs, they'll be stepping out of the window. And I think we should shed a little tear and turn away from the splat on the pavement. Because there's nothing to do with them, right? The uh, population no, you know, I was thinking back more to, uh, to what you said about uh, Ceausescu uh, and the, uh, you know, that, that uh, it, it would reach some critical point where the, the the bullshit would become apparent even to complete idiots, uh, and they would, you know, shout boo. Uh, and I mean, this is what's going to happen to the middle class. They're going to be constantly spun a yarn to string them along, uh, you know. And at some stage, uh, yeah, obviously, at some stage, a certain number of them are going to realise that it's just absolute crap. Um, so I guess that was more what I meant in terms of, you know, at what point would, uh, would you get? Yeah. That? So, <clears throat> yeah. So, so don't get into the mindset of, of Extinction Rebellion where they think, well, we need 3.5% of the people to wake up and then there will be, that's all upside down. So, so that comes from like Gene Sharp and stuff. And it's a complete misreading of the situation. You see, Gene Sharp wrote a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy. It's an irrelevant book or an upside down book because we're going from democracy to dictatorship. So it's completely upside down. You see, a dictator is a bully that basically, you know, has a spell over everybody. So Gene Sharp had ways to break the spell. So no one has a spell over us apart from this, the, the progressives, right? They have this millenarian hopium spell over, over the masses, right? But we, but it's a democracy. So why what Extinction Rebellion is trying to do doesn't work is, is okay, you fill the jails. It's like, and then what? Then the dictator falls from his pedestal. It's like, there isn't really one, right? It's like the houses of parliament don't close because the jails are full. No, 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, when I said, when I said, would they would some of them become radical? I mean, genuinely radicalized, not just activists. You know, I mean, just yeah, but, but one, abs absolutely one by spit one. the dummy. Mm. Oh, oh, one by one, and and then yeah. then they the this you see what's the avenue? So so you see it's it's like the madness of crowds. So they say like people go mad in crowds, and wake up individually in one by one. So they start to get sane one by one, drop by drop. But you see, what do you do when you when you suddenly see this and you, you get sane? Well, the very first thing is the system tells you that you've gone insane. So why a secret society in the cult format works is you can get people and say, you're not insane. Saying, you're saying, and they say, I knew I wasn't insane, and it's a fucking relief. And then you say, what do you do about it? And then you have a narrative. You say, basically, you know, the narrative has to be big and bold and say, we're going to take this whole system down, or at least the part of it we can. But, but aren't we all there? there? Aren't we all there? Like, all of us here, we're all coming from a kind of that background of suddenly waking up and seeing that, you know, we are sane. 
me, everybody. I mean, I feel yeah, yeah, but 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 we we, we <laughs> are we are the extinction audi. We are the extinction audi. It's just basically expanding other people to yeah, you know, to recruit other people to say you're not crazy. If uh, come and join us, and you'll, <laughs> you'll then you'll see crazy. <laughs> but you see, the more people that's you know, as people go and you say, well, then what do they do? Well, the the thing that they do is um, is is a formula, and then that's that's what we'll design with with the game. That's where the art comes in, and that's where the artists come in. To get back to your question, Gary, so so they they part of recruiting, and then they they part of creating the egregore. So if you saw in in Bright Axiom, what I really liked about that is you see all those powerful, powerful totems that they have, like the the statue that talks and each each one of these you know virtual characters and stuff that that are really almost apparition, they're almost paranormal entities. And so so those are very, very powerful. But what's so cool about them is they're parts of religion without religion. So there's no dogma, there's nothing to latch on to, there's no ideology to fight over or anything like that. It's all the trappings of religion, just as powerful and just as attractive and just as meaningful to people, with with no substance, so that you know basically no nobody starts getting dogmatic or something like that. So the idea is that you have you know structures and a religion, you know, a religion that isn't a religion. A hierarchy that isn't a hierarchy, you know. Yeah, a, a as you that said, that the, the depth of loyalty that you could get to that is far going to exceed yeah. what you would get to, to it, an abstract um, goal, it, you know. It it takes it takes a little while. It takes a little while. I don't I don't think anybody here has got it yet. But there comes a moment where if you do these things as fake things, what the power is that at some stage. Well, you get more, you get epiphany. So to join the Extinction Audi would take an epiphany and, you know, but once you know, there's epiphany after epiphany. And one of them is, is you start off with these kind of things like these religious totems as a kind of joke. It seems, if you look at, if you look at it in Bright Axiom, everybody is taking it a bit tongue in cheek and a bit, fuck, this is pretty meaningful. So it's, it's not enough of a joke to laugh at. And, you know, in the meantime, you're getting all the spirit. So if you do those Jungian sand sculptures and stuff like that, you, you're getting all the deep spiritual experience, right? But it is a game and you know that it's just play. Now, at a certain point you get to is, is you kind of, uh, how can I describe it? You make this kind of leap. So, how can I, how can I describe it? So the, okay, let me tr try my best. The, the leap is that, that you get, you get religious, okay? You, you start believing in that statue, I can't remember the name of it and stuff, the talks and stuff like that. You, you start to take it seriously, but at the same time as not taking it seriously. At some stage, there's this kind of a detachment where, where suddenly you don't need that stuff. You, 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 you kind of like you're over your addiction because, because you, you can see it, you can, you can take what you need from it and it doesn't have any power. And then you see all of these things don't have any power. There's this kind of release from all of these things that we hold dear and hold as attachments. So, what happens is you start playing everything as a game. So the whole thing becomes a giant game. And then you become a player in everything. See, see the problem is, in, in most of the world, is, is people have, they kind of like bad actors that have forgotten that they're in a play. So if, if you go to, like, Muslims and you clerics, especially people in power, they, they Take the role seriously. They think, I am a Muslim. They can argue the shit and stuff. And you, if you say something, they're offended and their face flushes red and they get angry and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. then, you know, they go from that to being detached. So then there's no commitment to being a Muslim. It's just, you know that being a Muslim is a game. You know that there's no Allah. Saying this is just pretense we do as as it's childish games that humans play. 
and, and that's a very, very powerful. From, from there on, it's almost like becoming a cardinal on a chessboard, or basically, it's it's like you know, getting a second queen on a chessboard and stuff. It's the you kind of get into another realm then, right? Because while everybody else is completely an ego and completely vested in their roles and their bullshit, is is suddenly you're just toying with them. You're toying with everybody. Nothing serious. You, in in effect, you're saying. Because in effect, you're in a world where all these people are batshit crazy, batshit crazy, and you're just humoring them. You're, you're just talking to them on their own terms. Just, And then, you see, that is very, very powerful because at some stage, people can feel that you're doing that. that you, you know, if, if you go and say, hey, to like a Muslim cleric, say, hey, tell me about Muslim. And I... You can talk him out of being a Muslim if you stay with him long enough, and you you pretend to be interested and genuinely interested, and he gradually realizes, hang on a minute, you think this is all fucking bullshit. You think this is all a game. You think you say, of course it is. Allah doesn't exist, you stupid cunt. And then his fucking head will explode. But you have done Allah in for him. He will never be able to pray to Allah. Or if he does, he just does it as a joke, thinking you know. And, but the the release, you know, it spreads. So it's kind of like being a liberated slave when you're still in the plantation. Now, if, yeah, if but I mean, it's, it's part of your. That you've mindset, got to have done the that. Plantation you... doesn't. No, but hang on, hang on, when, hang on. When, when you get a critical mass of people like that, it, a critical mass of slaves on the chain gang, the plantation can't hold together. It, it just disappears in the night. Just, just vaporizes like, like, you know, ether, like water vapor. But go on. What were you saying? Um. Yeah, but I, I mean, it's 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 not a a. Uh, it's, it's basically, what you're saying is that to get, but to get to that point, a person would have to have genuinely woken up. Um. Um. Uh, to to really start seeing that they. They're just playing a game with everything, um, you know. To have it, to, to sort of subtract, to depersonalize it, or de, de you know, by me remove the ego identification from it. Um, so it's still a big leap, um, you know. I mean, at the bottom line is you're still saying, you're, you're still saying that. Uh, um, the, the 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 key to everything is to wake up spiritually. That because that's what that's what it is. Um, there's going to be relatively few people get that or, or accomplish that. Um, no, not really. Because you see, it's infectious. You see, if you if you just did it one on one in an ashram uh, up in the Himalayas and stuff, yeah, it's. It's uh, not uh, going to go very far or very fast. But this is almost, sanity is kind of like a communicable disease, right? So, so when, when one person next to you gets it, people have a kind of an envy with it. Like, they think like, how did this idiot get it? They know that the person got it. And almost instantly, they can get it too. It's, it's it can. Yeah, I suppose it. too. You could look at it uh, in terms of some of the, the the mythologies too, where you know, uh, well, I mean, even in a way, it's in the in the biblical things where there's sort of this uh, acceleration towards the end. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, you can interpret that in various ways, but it could also. Be, you could look through that and say, yeah, it could also be, um, you know, groups of people coming together and acceler mutually accelerating their own awakening. Um, so I'm just thinking about it in those terms as well. Wouldn't it be something yeah, like Indra's net? Like, what was that? Can you say it again? Indra's net. Wouldn't Indra's net, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I well, interesting. I think I think Hugh could elaborate better on that than I could. I'm like only like tapped into his. Yeah, Alan wants with the tip of my finger, so I don't know too much about it. Um, 
sort of like see, everything. Well, the Indus Net is really a fractal thing. It is like thing. Indus Net. You see. But yeah. Indus Net is a fractal, yeah, it, you know. Yeah. So, so I don't think. I, it I mean, is so what I'm saying is that, like, the, the, well, the, yes, I guess it is, but. Yeah, I guess I guess you could. I wasn't thinking of it that way, but yeah, I, I, yeah, maybe the I was thinking of it in kind of a lower level, but maybe you you're right on a higher level, because once you get the quality of realizing that game, is is very fractal. It's 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 realizing you know the infinite, the infinite game. So it's an infinite game with no point, and it really is the dance of Lila or the the dance with Carly. So so maybe maybe yeah maybe DB you got it in one leap. You went you went further than I was going. Yeah, it, it went further than I was. <laughs> I thought, hang on, no, that's well, not quite, quite that's not quite the same, but maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think I think you get the prize for this. Explain extinction audio meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just have like when conversations happen, I just have like images come into my mind. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Sometimes because it's correct. Sometimes what you know, there's another, are, yeah. That's a very good one. There's another lesser one, which is is when uh, Krishna is talking to Arjuna, and and Arjuna asks. Krishna to to give him a vision of the absolute, and so Krishna opens his mouth, and um, and Arjuna looks inside and sees the universe, and it's too it's too much for him. He he can't look uh, look at it, and the reason is it's you know it's, it's fractal and infinite, and you know it's just overwhelming. Oh, that's just what Zaphod saw in the total perspective vortex. It's you know, it's cool. No, that, he stole it. He, no, no, Douglas Adams stole it. I'm so glad. That's what I'm vortex. saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, Douglas Adams just what else updated do you do? all this. What stuff. else did you do? <laughs> but but did you see that's the game? You see, you see, once once it's put in the back of our Gita, it's kind of serious shit. And then Douglas Adams takes it. He rips off it in a whole new way. It, it's, that's how the dance, the infinite dance, carries on. It's beautiful. But you can't do it if you take it all too seriously. So it's it's trying to get people to release their ego and to release their attachments and start to play. So so I have so much respect for Jeff Hull and those guys because they, they've got it. They, they understand it intuitively. Um, I don't know how deep it goes in terms of, you know, the depths of understanding and say the classics or something, but they, they've got it intuitively. Which, by the way, since we're on the subject, have, have we got? We should start rallying these guys, right? How, how are we doing? That's what that I was just going to say. What, what has anyone contacted Spencer uh, to find out yeah. the, about? Oh, I haven't asked him about Jeff. I thought um, it would be better. To kind of uh, rally him through a call, a private call, or what? Yeah. So, 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 as soon as we can get a private call with Spencer, and then we're unrecorded, and then, yeah. and then we can tell him our progress and stuff. Yeah, he has a few dates. Um, uh, yeah, that he's available in August, but uh, yeah, we can talk to him and see if we can bring in Jeff. Uh, as for Jordy, uh, he hasn't responded back, but it said that he, he's out on a short sabbatical until next, after tomorrow. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. And uh, what about Meow Wolf? Oh, Meow Wolf? Have you made... I haven't... Yeah. Don't know anybody... Who, who I should contact. I guess that's where to start. But, uh, uh, um, a, the, can I, ask I found a guy that I think is the founder. Yeah, I'll, I'll look. I'll look it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hugh, how do you spell that? Is that referring to that shop you were talking about? Is it? Yeah. 
How do you now spell wolf it? Is I, I M-E- M-E-U-W space wolf. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I don't know much about it. We just I just wanted to, yeah. Yeah. Um, can there, we stop there? there? That's been terrible. Of the story. Okay. Is it under that name? There, there is. Yeah, there's a documentary. I can't remember what the documentary is, but there is one okay. that's where they told their whole story. Yeah, it's called uh, Meow Wolf, the or- origin story. And it's... Um, okay, yeah. origin, origin yeah. story. Yeah. Origin story. All right. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And, and I it didn't seemed quite that. similar. And you made it all up to I've spent the message to Fonty. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, who is Hugh going to send the message to Faulty? Or, or I, I, I'll reply, you're, you're, and then I'll offer a, a call tomorrow with Hugh yeah. uh, on the platform, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay. I think it right. might be better to arrange the specifics directly with him because you're the one who's going. I, I can just do really uh, answer and say that you're, you're willing to go. You and uh, you know you discuss all that with him. Okay. Anyway, I'm too That'd tired to do anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think we've been going for a long time. Okay, let's let's, let's end it here. What, yep. what about yeah yeah let's stop. So what what, what about GDR? GDR. Um, no, I'm sorry. DGR. Uh, Lear and Max haven't responded. Uh, Derek pretty much said the same thing. He's uh, he sent the same message that he's in support, but he might not have time. Um, but he he is interested. If you want to do a, an interview with him, would you like to? Uh, yeah, that? let's have a talk that's not recorded. Not, not recorded. recorded. Okay, I can see. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I'll let you. With know all if three, if we could. Right. Yeah, yeah. with all three. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And All oh, right, now it's... I, so Lionel, Lionel Schnell said he's completely on board. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. Wow. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I watched that talk. That was really good. Yeah, Can we... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. Can you, uh, are you going, have you planned uh, at the next talk with him or? Yeah, I must. Um, I, I think yeah, we really I was, should get him, I, get him into yeah. his magic because I think that sounds like the kind of thing that would just, just fit beautifully in with the art. Just get him to rave on about yeah. his magic. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's uh, just, brilliant. Just how to how to do a cult. I mean, I think, I think how to do a cult is is him and me. That's our our contribution. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, the, uh, the the cult thing that I read about, which really impressed me, which wasn't a death cult. Uh, it wasn't destructive. It was amazing. The construct. It was the uh, Damonher. Um, in in Italy, that you know, Falco Terasaka, and that's that 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 was amazing what they accomplished, and and they're still going, and uh, um and that's not a uh, terminal. I think that's a really uh, uh, that's an interesting example just just to look at, you know, um, and you know even even uh, Raj Nish as well because in the end Raj Nish didn't end, end the way. Jonestown and all the rest of it did. Everybody was was uh, you know pretty upset, but they were all okay, you know. Um, yeah, the, but, uh, the Maharishi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he just left. Uh, you know, I mean, what happened in Damanhur? I don't know. They got sprung because it was a big secret, and then it suddenly got found out what they were doing. But it didn't entirely fall apart. Um, 
and even now that the, the cult leader has died, apparently it's still going. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Or, or a bender and, they, they, and they were, and they, you know, they were completely invested just in fantasy. I, I mean, it had all these incredible symbolisms and all the rest of it, but it was just a complete wallow in, in yeah. like, you know, anything that was sort of Baroque and decorative and they were completely into it, you know. Um, yeah, well, Aurobindo is the same, right? Oh, mm, mm. Yeah. Well, anyway, okay. well, that's enough. Let's, that's enough. Let's let's round it off. Right, so, so, okay, let's just pause one time and just just let everything go. Relax. Get grounded. Pause deeply still. Connect to that silence. Om Paramatmane Namah. Great, everybody. Shanti, shanti, shanti. Yeah. <laughs> shanti, shanti. Yeah, shanti, shanti. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. See you later then. Bye. 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 Okay. Be safe.